Episode 26, August the 25th to 28th, 1914. They were going to shoot me. By Paul Mays, DCM, MM, Croix de Gay. Read by Gareth Williams. The author of this thrilling narrative was, for four and a half years, one of the most remarkable figures on the Western Front. A French artist and a fluent English speaker, he attached himself to the Scots Greys on their landing at Havre and acted as an informal interpreter and liaison officer. Afterwards, he was on the staff of Sir Hubert Gough, who pays unstinted tribute to his skill and bravery. Here, he tells how, during the retreat from Mons, he was within an ace of being shot as a spy. August 26. I woke up suddenly. It was daylight. I didn't know where I was. I only felt the weight of my boots. I looked at my watch. I had slept five hours. Not a sound came from the village. I peeped through the window. The street was deserted. I slipped down the stairs into the kitchen, shouting for madame. Her bread and coffee lay on the table. I got no response. Full of apprehension, I ran up the stairs, and as I seized my cap and revolver belt, I heard the clatter of horses' hoofs. The square tops of Ulan helmets were passing right under my window. I paused, breathless. Then a motor car rushed through the streets, carrying a party of Germans, revolvers in hand. I had to push the window open gently to see if anyone else was coming. The two riders I had seen turn off to the right were now out of sight. I had to act quickly. Fortunately, the village was small. Each farm opened onto a yard. I had to avoid the roads. The kitchen door was locked. It gave on to a small garden. I jumped out of the window and climbed a wall covered with pearls, crossed over a lane into a farmyard, slipped through some stables into an open space and made for another farm, where a few hens, picking at a manure heap, ran off with much fluttering. At the next farm, looking through a window, I saw some people in a room. I rushed in. They were terrified, reviving themselves with brandy. Quickly, I said, which is the best way out of the village? Have you seen many German troops? How long have the English been gone? They all talked at once. One little fellow, a hunchback, caught hold of my arm and said, Suivez-moi. And I followed him. After much dodging about, we came to a wall. I peeped over and saw an expanse of country that looked like the whole of France, spread in the sunlight. The trees of two main roads divided the landscape. One led to Saint-Quentin. I shook the hand of my guide, who said, Bon chance! Sauvez-vous vite! Hiding the best way I could, I crept towards the road, shuffling noisily to a wet cabbage patch that soaked me to the skin. After a short run, I flung myself headlong into the ditch bordering the road. Carefully, I looked around. Not a soul could be seen anywhere. I put my ear to the ground, but detected no sound. I got up and ran, dodging from tree to tree, which happily were thick and not far apart, stopping only to recover my breath. I watched every haystack, keeping my eye on a village to my right. I had just paused a moment and was on the verge of rushing forward again when there, standing against a bright wall, were three houlans, their shadows distinctly reflected on the wall. My eyes glued to them. I dared not move. A cold shiver ran down my spine, as one of them rode his horse across the open towards a group of small haystacks about two hundred yards from where I was. Stopping suddenly, he stood up in his stirrups and looked through his field glasses. He took his time, concentrating on certain places. I could see his dark horse lashing the air with its tail. Nothing, evidently, had arrested his attention in my direction, but when he waved to the others and they promptly joined him at a quick trot, I thought I was finished. They stood a while conversing, then looked round, and to my relief turned their horses 
and started at an easy trot, moving back towards the village, their lances with folded pennants rocketing above their heads. As I had my eyes fixed on them, I heard coming up a kind of flapping sound. It was a dog running straight at me. I gave a sudden jerk as he neared. It frightened him off, and with a suppressed yelp, he swelled and ran on, his tail between his legs, trailing a lead. Meanwhile, the Ulan had neared the village and were vanishing behind farms. There was nothing for me to do but run. I looked in every direction first and called to the other side of the road, seeing as I did the dog, away in front, still running for all it was worth. What saved me was the depth of the ditch and the bank on both sides of the road. By bending down, I could run along nearly sure that I could not be seen from the fields. What distance I covered, I don't know. When two sharp shots rang out ahead on my right, echoing from wood to wood, I felt the atmosphere relapse into a drawn silence as I lay with my face to the ground expecting to hear more firing. Nothing more happened. I got up again, looking intently to the right. I was inwardly so anxious and excited that I could hardly see. The light was also too bright. I was now nearing the line of trees along a road crossing mine, and as the ground rose slightly towards it on my left, I couldn't actually see all of it, so called back to the other side. No sooner had I done so, that a few more shots were fired, and distinctly I located the report coming from a bushy belt of trees, where for a second I imagined seeing the khaki of our uniforms. The light was so dazzling, I dared not yet believe my eyes, but at that moment, unmistakably, two of our cavalry strode across the road away in front. Hopes raised, I waited. There, among the leaves, I could see red faces. I was now sure. Having advanced a little more, I cleared the bank, waving and bolting across the distance that separated us, I shot in amongst them as between two goalposts. They were our cavalry, dismounted. Their horses were just at hand, a few paces off. For a moment I could hardly talk. The officer told me that I was lucky, for German patrols were about, and they had been firing at anyone who showed himself. You are lucky they didn't see you. Your regiment must be about somewhere. They passed early in the morning. You had better walk to brigade headquarters at... two miles away. They may be able to direct you. Having joined a Highland Light Infantryman, who had strayed from his battalion, and who was walking the same way, I heard the details of a severe scrap in which he had been engaged. His haversack was full of unripe apples, which he kept munching and spitting out. Red-haired, tall, as brown as a berry, with a terrific border accent, he looked the picture of health, in spite of his weary march. The village we walked into was occupied by our infantry, and in the middle of the market square there stood a throng of officers, obviously engaged in stern conversation. Among them was a stoutish man with a grey moustache, General Sir Charles Monroe, who commanded the 2nd Division. As I was still new to the army, the sight of red tabs had not the sobering effect on me that it had on a regular private. I rashly imagined that the staff would welcome any information that I might be able to give. I boldly approached the group of officers, saluted, and inquired the whereabouts of the Scots craze or of the transport with which I had lost touch. I was about to say where I had come from and what I had seen when the general cut me short, looked at me from head to toe and replied that the greys had passed through the village earlier that day, but that he had no idea where their transport had gone. Suddenly his face twitched and he abruptly asked my name. I saw suspicion in his stare. Where have you come from? I mentioned the village. The place has been occupied by the enemy since early this morning, he replied. I felt a stir among those listening. One officer walked quickly away. What village did you say you were in? I could not remember the name. What is the name of your colonel? My memory failed me entirely. What squadron are you in? My mind was a blank. 
I had the sensation of the ground receding under my feet as I was seized and my belt and revolver taken from me. I was immediately searched right down to my patties. Handcuffed, my legs trembling under me, I was led off to join a party of German soldiers and Belgian civilians who were standing by the headquarters baggage, tied to one another. We were marched off at once, escorted by men with fixed bayonets. I could hardly realise anything. The general and his staff soon after passed us in his car without even looking at us. It was no use my appealing. I heard a man say, Here's another blasted spy. It made me realise the situation I was in. It was useless to try to get a hearing from my escort. I could not talk to the German prisoners, who all the time were mumbling to me, Bist du Deutsch? I did not answer. I heard them discuss me. They couldn't make out what I was. The three Belgians looked such ruffians, I thought it wise not to address them at all. We were made to step out, to keep well behind the rear of the transport. There was a general sign of hurry about everything. Riders were driving their heels into their horses. The infantry alongside us were marching fast. The dew had laid the dust, but the sun was very hot, although it was still early morning. Staring at the wagon before me, I followed the sound of it squealing as one does a tune. I walked on, dazedly, as though in a dream, not realising yet the full extent of what hung over me. A loud rumble of guns on our right grew nearer and nearer. In a village where we rested later in the day, the exhausted refugees livened up as they saw the espion. They spat at us and threw stones. One French territorial, for some unknown reason alone in that village, came up to us seething with rage, waving his bayonet. Our guard became furious and handled him very roughly. He was foaming at the mouth. We resumed our weary march, picking up as we went on a considerable number of stragglers belonging to all sorts of regiments. From their appearance, it was evident that they had had a bad time, but they looked determined and walked on, keeping in rank. Motorcyclists and staff cars would rush past, raising a cloud of dust. Artillery would cut across fields, leaving the road free for infantry. Everybody was bent on pushing on. Every echo I heard of the situation sharpened my apprehension. We overtook a halted wagon line, and as ill luck would have it, three German prisoners we had had with the transport the day before recognised me and waved. As they had been with us for a whole day, I had chatted to them a good deal to try to get some information out of them, so of course they knew me quite well. How could I explain to the guards who had seen them greet me the circumstances of our acquaintance? The incident was at once reported to the military police, and nothing I could say made things any better. I was in a divided frame of mind, for, although I stood accused, and I knew I was hated and despised by anyone who caught sight of me, I could not help liking and admiring these soldiers. When night came, I was led to a small shrine on the side of the road. Tired out, I lay down, a meek statue of the Virgin Mary above my head. I remembered what a nun had said on my way north as she pressed a medal into my hands. Indeed, I needed now all the help in the world, even hell's. The night was very cold. Troops went by incessantly. Above the shuffling of feet, I heard my sentry solemnly remark, Why don't they shoot the bastard and be done with him, instead of keeping us shivering out here all night? Somewhere in the darkness a fierce engagement was taking place, not many miles away. August the 27th I was led out of my shrine into a thick fog at an early hour. Artillery, transport and infantry seemed to be all mixed up, and as units extricated themselves from the rainy confusion and got onto the road, an officer shouted out where they were, giving them directions. The three German prisoners of the day before were brought up. I joined them at once, and we followed in the wake of a large column of infantry. We were given biscuits and a tin of bully beef. Something serious had happened during the night. I didn't know what it was, but I sensed it by the way the horses pulled and the chains strained 
by the voices of the drivers, the pace of the marching men. All indicated the gravity of the situation. The enemy was obviously pressing on. In all this, I wondered what would happen to me. After we had been on the march for some hours, the day cleared brilliantly. Suddenly, as I marched alongside some kilted men, my eyes fell on a French soldier who happened to be a friend of mine. I hailed him, and we walked along together. He had fought at Charrois and lost touch with his regiment. As he knew no English, it was difficult for him to explain that I was an old friend, but he managed to tell an officer who understood French. Unfortunately, this didn't help me, as the troops became separated from each other, and I even lost touch with my friend. We walked on all that day. My feet were sore. I had thought much. So many problems and possibilities had flooded my weary mind that I could think no more. All I felt were my feet. A fierce battle was being fought over on our left. I detected the rumble of the French 75s. Late at night, I was taken into a bedroom of a large modern house, standing in the street of a fairly big place, which was plunged into utter darkness. There were two beds in the room. We were three. I took one. For the first time since leaving Mans, my guards took off their boots. I couldn't remember when I had last done so. It didn't seem a relief at first, rather the opposite. One of the guards was a cockney whom I felt was sympathetic. The other man, a Scot, never answered when I spoke. Only once did he speak, to say, Dinner worry. If you're a spy, you'll be shot a wreck. If you know, you will not obey. It was logical enough. My cockney was much more loquacious. Left once alone with me, he even told me that he knew they were all wrong, that I was not a spy. I had been resting a little while when the provost marshal walked in with my aversack. He produced several things belonging to me and asked if the razor was mine. Yes, it was. A German razor bought in Hamburg years ago, and I added that if he had had any experience of German or Swedish razors, he would use one himself. He went out smiling. After his visit, I couldn't sleep. I listened to the guns booming to the east and west of us, the sounds increasing intermittently in an alarming way. The air was heavy with a tension which overpowered all my feelings. I watched the dawn filter into the room. It was barely light when the stairs suddenly trembled with loud footsteps and the banging of rifle bayonets. The door was flung open. The provost marshal stood framed in the doorway and the raucous voice of a sergeant major behind him ordered the prisoner to be marched out. Quickly, my guard and I slipped on our boots. The cockney looked up inquiringly. Never you mind me, lad. Get ready quick. Attention! March down. And without a word, I followed, ready for the worst. There was a tremendous bustle in the street, created by baggage wagons and the infantry hurrying through the village. We waited for a chance of getting across. I heard the clatter of horses and men's voices shouting, Make room for the cavalry! My eyes then fell on Major Collins, leading an approaching squadron of Scots Greys. I shouted, Major Collins! He turned at the sound of his name, but didn't see me, for he went on. Desperately I shouted again, but my vain appeals were drowned in the tumult of the rushing traffic, while I became hidden from the rest of the troops by the passing wagons. There you are. None of the greys have recognised him, said one of my escort. But as they were bundling me through the clearing made by the disappearing horses, Major Sweetenham, appeared, leading the next squadron. I didn't have to shout to him. He had seen and recognised me. His arm was raised, and the squadron had halted. He asked in a puzzled way what I was doing here under arrest. In a few words I told him, Sergeant, where is the provost marshal? He'd gone on. Lead me to him, said the major, and we all hurried across the road where the escort and I were told to wait. In a few moments, both the Major and the Provost Marshal were walking towards me with a smile on their faces. Come along quickly, said the Major. They were going to shoot you. 
and stopping one of Jay Battery's limbers, he told me to jump on it as he had no else to spare. I felt everything suddenly widen around me. The battery immediately bolted along the main road towards La Faire, shaking me out of all bearings, but a feeling of relief had surged through the whole of my being. After going on for some time, within sight of a small village called Cerisi, on the saint quentin la faire road, we came onto part of the greys, halted in the middle of a cup-shaped plain. J. Battery drew up, and I immediately went towards Colonel Bulkley Johnson, whom I saw sitting on a heap of stone, on the side of the road, talking to Major Swittenham. He looked pleased on seeing me approach, for he had concluded, after missing me for the last two days, that I had been taken prisoner. He expressed in his charming way much sympathy for what I had gone through it. He said, you must remember that the 2nd Infantry Division have had a very bad time, and they have been very nervy about spies. One can hardly trust one's brother these days. Such odd things have happened. He told me to remain with J. Battery in the meantime, as I would be in good hands with Major Seligman, who commanded the battery. Thank you.